Hello everybody, this is Dr Christopher White and in this presentation we're going to be thinking about earth materials. So this is going to correspond to section 4.1 of your textbook. So the first question is what materials will a geologist regularly encounter? Then the answer is there's two of them, rocks and minerals. So let's begin thinking about what the difference is between a rock and a mineral. Well the answer is actually quite straightforward. A rock is made up of minerals, a mineral is not made up of rocks. So a rock essentially is consists of one or more minerals all mixed together. So that's a very important distinction that we always need to bear in mind. Minerals and rocks are separate and minerals are the building blocks of rocks. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, four different situations and we're going to think about how a geologist would think about these environments uh, at different scales. So we're going to begin by looking at this image of Yosemite National Park here. So what can we see? Well, we can quite clearly see we have this area of grey rock here. It's exposed, it's forming topographic highs, and you'll notice that it's very lightly vegetated. We also have this area in the middle here where you can see we have a very heavily vegetated river valley. So as a geologist, I'm going to be thinking to myself, OK, right, well, just looking at this rock here, it looks to be a, approximately the same colour consistently. So that would suggest maybe it's all the same rock. And the other thing I'm going to notice is the fact that it forms these topographic highs, which suggests that it's more resistant to erosion. And so I'm going to, you know, use those as my basic uh, hypotheses about this particular unit. Now, in terms of what's going on down here in the river valley, I've got to think, well, why is the river located there? In geology, typically rivers will follow either weak layers of rock, which they can erode more easily to create a river valley, or there could be some other kind of feature running down here, such as a fault, which the river is also preferentially exploiting. So there is the possibility that this area here in the middle marked out by the river valley is a, maybe a different rock, which is softer than the surrounding grey rock, or maybe there's some kind of geologic feature in here which is encouraging the river to move down that particular path. So on a broad scale, we're not getting any fine detail, but we're having a general think about what could possibly be producing the environment that we're looking at. Now, the next step will be to go down and look at the outcrop in finer detail. And so when we start looking at the outcrop, what we're going to do is we're going to start thinking to ourselves, how do these different rock units relate to each other if there are different rock units? So, for instance, we'll start thinking about things like, right, you know, if I can see one or more different uh, units of rock, which one's the youngest, which one's the oldest? If I can see faults or maybe igneous intrusions cutting the layers of rock, how does that fit into our chronological sequence for the development of, that, of those rocks? So on an outcrop scale, we're going to start thinking about the relationships between the rocks. Now, obviously, we can't see any relationships between rocks in this image here because it's simply too large, too broad in its scale. So there's not enough fine detail. As soon as we get down to an outcrop scale, we can begin to say, right, I think this rock is the oldest. I think this rock is the youngest. I think, you know, I think this fault uh, cut the sequence of rocks at this time, etc. Now, once we've analysed our outcrop, we're going to stay at the outcrop and we're going to get even finer because the next thing we need to do is we actually need to start working out, well, what are the rocks we've got? So we can see in our outcrop, maybe we've got rock A, rock B and rock C, but until we actually get in close and really look at the minerals, we cannot classify our rocks. So it's not until this point when we can actually look at the rock, get really close in and start saying, right, I see these minerals, uh, their proportions are you know, let's, you know, 10%, 20%, 30% of the total rock. And I will use this to classify my rock based on the minerals that are present and their relative abundances. And so that's how we would classify something like an igneous rock or so something like a granite. Then there are other types of rocks like sedimentary rocks where we'll look at the clasts. We'll look at, you know, how big are the pieces of rock that make up our, um, our sedimentary rock. And we'll start to use that to classify our rock. So it's not until this point when we can really begin to you know, get into the fine detail of what we can see. We can also begin to see certain textures. So in this particular rock you can see here, you can see we've got lots of finer crystals marked out by these black flecks. But you'll also notice that there are some bigger crystals in here as well. 
And so we, this mixture of larger crystals and smaller crystals is called a porphyritic texture. And we'll be discussing that in the future when we look at igneous rocks. But as a geologist, this tells me something about how this particular rock formed. So the final step that a geologist can take is we can actually take something called a thin section. And a thin section uh, involves taking a piece of the rock, taking it back to a lab, and essentially taking a very, very thin slice of the rock, and we'll glue it onto a glass slide. And the, the slice of rock that we'll take is 30 microns thick, so that's 0 0.03 millimeters. So it's a very, very thin piece of rock. It has to be thin because uh, that thickness, it allows light to pass through the rock, uh, pass through the mineral, should I say, or should I say most minerals, so we can identify them using a microscope. And so as a geologist, if I look at this image here, I can spot that I've got at least four separate minerals by the looks of it in my field of view. I have this brown black mineral down here, which is probably the mineral biotite. I have this rather uh, garishly colored uh, pink green mineral here, which is probably the mineral muscovite. I have uh, this mineral down here that has this kind of uh, almost tiger striped appearance. That's probably potassium feldspar. And then I have these gray minerals here, gray crystals here, which is probably the mineral quartz. Now I'm a trained geologist. I can work this out relatively quickly, but why is this kind of information important? Well, this kind of very fine detail information is actually what's going to tell us exactly how our rock formed. So for instance, I can see things like if I look here, I have a crystal of biotite right there, and it's contained within a crystal of quartz. So I, that for, therefore, that tells me instantly that the crystal of biotite must have been there before the crystal of quartz formed. So I'm starting to get together a sequence of in which order the minerals were deposited. Another thing is that I can see is I can see what's happened to the rock after it's been formed. So if I look at my, uh, my sample here, I can see that this crystal of quartz isn't a nice consistent color. It's not homogenous. It actually has some variation to the color. Now, this is because this crystal of quartz has what's called undulose extinction. And this is because the crystal has been squished. It's been compressed. And so this tells me that this particular sample of rock at some point, at least on one occasion, has been compressed. It's been squished. And so that's, some, that's telling me something about the rock's history, but it's also telling me something about the more general environment in which that rock existed. At some point, the area has been exposed to compressive tectonic forces. And then as a geologist, I'll have to try and work out, right, why, you know, why did that compressive event occur? And maybe when did it occur? And so you can see on varying scales, there's lots and lots of different information that a geologist can obtain from the rocks. So next we need to think about what a mineral actually is. So what are the criteria that we need to use to classify a substance as a mineral? Well, the first thing that a mineral has to be is it has to be solid at room temperature. Now, this is obviously quite a quite an important one. So most minerals, think of a regular mineral you might have come across, like quartz, is solid at room temperature. So therefore, it's met the first criteria to be considered a mineral. There are some substances that some people consider to be minerals, but the vast majority of geologists do not. So obviously, there's the question of is mercury a mineral? Well, it's a liquid at room temperature, but some people do consider it a mineral, but most geologists will not. Um, in the case of one particular mineral, which is, of course, ice, we have a bit of a problem. Ice is going to be solid at room temperature, but at the same time, it's also going to be melting at room temperature. So ice falls into a bit of a grey zone about whether it is technically a mineral or not. So, you know, that, 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 this, this solid rule isn't a perfect rule, but, you know, 99.9% .9 of minerals will be solid at room temperature. The next thing is that our mineral has to be naturally occurring. It can't be made through industrial processes. So think of something like tungsten carbide, which is used on things like drill bits. That is not considered to be a mineral because it is essentially a material which has been produced by humans. The next criteria is our material has to be inorganic. So this means it has to have been produced by a geologic process. So the picture of the thin section that we saw before, it contained four minerals, biotite, muscovite, potassium, feldspar, and quartz. 
and these minerals will have formed through the cooling down of a magma. And so we know that those minerals will have formed through a geologic process, and so you know they meet one of the criteria to be considered a mineral. In contrast, protein crystals forming inside of bacteria would not be considered a mineral. That's because the crystals which form, although, although they are solid and although they are naturally occurring, have been formed by a biologic process. So they are an organic crystal. And as such, we cannot consider them minerals. So the next criteria our material has to meet is it has to have an internal structure which is ordered. So this means the atoms have to be in a rigid framework and you have to see the same atoms repeating themselves again and again. So that you have to have an ordered internal structure to your mineral. So this is one of the reasons why some materials which you think, well, maybe they could be minerals, are not classified as minerals. And the classic example would be something like uh, glass, window glass. So window glass is made from uh, essentially melting quartz, and then you, you know, allow it to re-solidify, to harden again, and it creates a, a pane of glass. Now, the thing is, is the atoms that make up a regular quartz crystal, which are silicon and oxygen, are present in a nice, repeating, ordered structure. Okay, so you see the same atoms appearing again and again and again in an ordered and uniform way. In contrast, a pane of window glass does not have the same order to it. The, the atoms of silicon and oxygen are at random orientations to one another. And so this means that you do not have a nice, nicely ordered internal structure. And so you cannot consider a pane of window glass to be a mineral. It also, of course, falls down on the fact that it's not a natural material. You know, it's, it's made by humans. But, you know, if we just ignore that, um, you know, uh, based on the fact that it does not have an ordered internal structure, a pane of window glass could not be considered a mineral. In contrast, a crystal of quartz, which does have a nice ordered internal structure, can most definitely be considered a mineral. The final criteria that our material has to meet is it has to have a specific chemical composition. So our mineral has to be homogenous. You can't have, you know, huge variation in the, in the chemical composition of your crystal. So it means that, you know, once again, going back to quartz, I know the chemical formula for quartz is SiO2. And so, you know, I, I can't have any variation in that chemical formula. Now, if I start seeing variation in the chem chemical formula, that would imply that maybe I actually have a couple of minerals mixed together, in which case my sample is heterogeneous. And as such, I would have to separate out those two minerals and analyze them individually. So these are the five criteria that a material must meet in order to be considered a mineral. And it has to satisfy all of these five criteria. Otherwise, it will not be considered as a mineral. Okay, thank you for watching, everybody, and have a good day.